Our message this morning comes from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's word. Amen. Thank you for coming out and being a part of this worship service. And thank you also for the reminder of the work of God to the benefit of many people, to the glory of Christ in the Reformation. We'll be mentioning that next Sunday, uh, Reformation Sunday. And this is uh, when Luther penned this him, he understood the pressures that were against the gospel in this day, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, um, he was able to see in some measure the work of Christ and um, abound, and many people converted, and lives changed in the midst of great struggle. So we ask God, would you reform and revive your people once again, who are just as we are so logy, we are so not only weighed down by our culture, but weighed down by the weight of sin, self-centeredness. I know for I participate in it. Oh God, help me by your grace. The, the walk through First Kings is completed, and we learned through that repeatedly that all of the kings that came, all of them, although some had some, some good qualities, they weren't the final king. The final king is the name, is, is found in the name of Jesus, Jesus the Christ. And the Apostle Paul will, through the book of Ephesians, lift him up. This letter that Paul wrote about the year A.D. 60, this letter was written whilst he was in prison, and it was written to Ephesus, and it would seem a collection of churches in um, a similar cultural area. And so it's multiple, be viewed as multiple um, audience, a multiple audience to receive the letter, but in particular the people at Ephesus. So here was a place, if you think of Ephesus, historically, good historians tell us that it was a corrupt place. It was a place, uh, you could say the culture was opposed to the gospel. People were addicted to pleasure, materialism, emperor worship. Many other idolatrous practices. It was into this corrupt culture that Paul wrote by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he he spoke to the people at Ephesus and to other churches in the surrounding area. He spoke to them knowing that they were facing many battles. Great was the corruption and great was the opposition. So the church needed to be encouraged and by the Holy Spirit, God sent Paul to write and to give to the church a way forward in the midst of all this craziness. So if you look at the book of Ephesians, you'll notice um, 
in the chapters that there are many mighty themes. And they still take our breath away when we read them. There's divine mystery in it. And regarding salvation, thanksgiving is offered. Grace is highlighted. Union with Christ and spiritual strength. Then from the chapters 4 to the end, you see topics like the body of Christ, new life in Jesus. And you see the Christian family and spiritual conflict in full bloom before the people of God. And so we're going to examine just the first two verses, chapter 1 of Ephesians, verses 1 and 2. And we might be uh, quick to walk over them and say, well, this is just a form. Uh, but no, this is the very word of God. Paul is being moved by the Holy Spirit to use particular words to encourage the church in this introduction. And so we're going to listen very carefully to it and ask God to help us as he helped the original church, the first hearers and readers, and to help us today, the, those who have received this great blessing from the hand of the apostle. So, this must not be brushed off. It's a powerful aid to believers who live in troubled times. And believe you, me, this, according to the scholars who know what they're doing, the people in Ephesus were up against it, so to speak. Hey, it wasn't an easy time to proclaim Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to live with great peace in an era of great wickedness. Help us through this word today to extend, to extend our lives, to increasingly include the things that you would have us to include, and by the Spirit's aid to live them out well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Recently, Transparency International. What a name, eh? Transparency International. I work for Transparency International. They can see right through us. We're, this group ranked America as considerably more corrupt than most of the rest of the first world. We're increasingly a place of corrupt politics, corrupt courts, corrupt media, corrupt education. We have corrupt entertainment corrupt religion increasingly where we have more of a focus on abc living attendance buildings and cash corruption furthermore according to the pew research center only 19 percent of americans say they trust the government that must have been on a good day they trust the government most of the time, down from 73% in 1958. Corruption makes a nation sick and soon ushers in persecution on top of the heads of those who speak truth. And I'm speaking especially of the Christian church. Oh, God, help us. More corrupt are we than most of the rest of the first world, according to Transparency International. So, in a sense, very little has changed since AD 60 when Paul was in prison and writing this letter to the Ephesian church. Ephesus was a place of great evil, a place of corruption. The church had to live in the midst of such trouble and Paul, by the Holy Spirit, was writing to encourage them in their faith. So he's, he knows what corruption is like. He's lived it himself and by the grace of God, he's free, though battling forward in his life. So today we're going to receive a blessing just as the early church did, as Paul brings this letter, and he's bringing it by the power of the Holy Spirit to the Ephesian church, and by the same Spirit today, he's bringing it to the church at Kwamba. He's bringing it to the church in Mora. He's bringing it to the church in Hinckley. He's bringing it to the church in Africa. 
He's bringing it to the church in China. He's bringing it to the Christians in Iran. And this is his greeting, verses 1 and 2. The text is this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is all over this introduction. Notice he didn't say LOL. What does that mean anyway? Lots of lettuce? Notice his form, and he's seeking to answer a question like this, and we must pose questions of the text or we won't get any answers. What does God provide for his people who are living in corrupt places? That's the, that's the question I want to raise of this little piece of text here. Okay, what does, provide, what does God provide for his people who are living in in corrupt places. We see this through the life of Paul, and we're going to see it in the life of the Ephesian church, and we're going to see it applied in our modern day today. So for what does God provide for his people who are living in corrupt places? Three things, message, perspective, and blessing. That's it. Not attendance buildings and cash. He provides message, perspective, and blessing. Here's the first one, message. Paul, notice this, chapter 1, verse 1a, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. The apostle Paul one day was on his way to Damascus, a persecutor of the church, a hater of of the true king and that king whose name is Jesus confronted him. And I just to remind us all, we go to Acts chapter nine and we take a look at this passage. But Paul, Acts nine verse one, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Notice, it came from heaven. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Notice that the persecution of the church, in its primary sense, is the persecution of Christ. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. This is Christ, sent by the Father to claim Paul. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. Interesting phrase, isn't it? So they led him by the hand and they brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Come back to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. An apostle is a messenger. Uh, one called out one. Sent to bring the message of the gospel, it is the gospel of Christ Jesus. And it is a gospel by the will of God. So he's called to be an apostle. Called, first of all, into faith, and then called, on top of that, to be a messenger. He was authorized and sent by Christ. He was given the authority to present the gospel 
in spoken and written manners. Notice, he is an apostle of Christ Jesus and no one else, not of the emperor. And he's an apostle by the will of God. He did not appoint himself. He did not go on the internet and look up how to be an apostle. And he did not send an email to a place and get back a sheet of paper saying, you are an apostle now. He was chosen by God's will. It was not based on any personal merit because he had none. He was a murderer of the truth. This was based on God's grace. His unmerited favor was based entirely on the will of God. God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and compassion on whom he will have compassion. Paul did not say, I have a spark of human goodness and I deserve to be your messenger, O oh Jesus. And Jesus, who wasn't doing much of anything at the time in heaven, decided, oh, I better go speak to him. He's kind of forceful. I don't think so. The Lord Jesus, in his majesty, confronted Saul. This persecutor of the church was called by Christ to be a messenger of the gospel with particular focus on the Gentiles. So when Paul speaks or writes by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is speaking the very word of Christ. So as we read this letter, we shall be encouraged by that truth. This is the very word of God. Furthermore, although he was a persecutor of the church, he has a right to speak the word of God, for he's being called by the will of God. He's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Yes, he was a wretch, a wretched individual who hated truth, and yet God saved him. And so, it is only on the basis of the will of God that he speaks the word of God. And so, he has the right to do so into the ears of the people around him. Now in our day, we have this message that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. We have it in its entirety. We are not dependent on ourselves or any modern prophet or self-appointed apostle. We're not dependent on a pope or an archbishop. We have the very word of Christ to guide us in the ministry of the gospel. We have enough. We have the right to speak the word to our family and friends, even though they may know of our past sins. I know of my life, and I know of those times when I was drunk. And I know of my licentiousness, but I know in whom I have believed. How about yourselves? Has the enemy ever reminded you of your past sins and says, what right do you have to tell other people about Jesus? I say to you, in the name of Christ, because you have been saved, because you have been given the authority to tell the truth by the power of the Holy Spirit, herein contained, you have that right to speak. Oh yes, a sinner egregious, but yes, a saint by the power of God. More on that in a moment. We have the right to speak the word of God to our family and friends, even though we may know of our past sins and they too know and may point at them. So here are some things to consider. What role does God, God's word play in our lives? Do we see it as authoritative, coming from the person of the Holy Spirit through Paul to us. 
Do we see it as having authority even this day in our own lives and in the lives of others? Is it our desire to know God more and more and to act on his word every day? Are we bold in our presentations of truth? Not rude, but bold, even though our lives may be tainted by our past sins. Maybe we have physical limitations because of our past sins. And yet, by the Holy Spirit, we can have boldness and confidence in the message because it is from the throne of grace. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, he has a message to bring. Apostola, he is a messenger. He brings the truth. And he brings it by the will of God. Not by his own will, not by his own record of merit, because it hasn't any. Only from heaven does he speak. And in the modern sense, we too can take this word and take it to the world and take it with confidence because it still is authoritative. It is from the very hand of God. So what does God provide for his people living in corrupt places? A message. A message that is authorized, stamped by Christ for us to present. It was first presented by the Apostle Paul and by the Holy Spirit. We have it today. Pass it on. We have a message. What does God provide for his people who are living in corrupt places? A message of truth. And in this era, we're lying abounds. I don't know to quote Sylvester the Cat when I watch debates and other things. It is amazing to me that liars' pants don't actually catch on fire. And there are plenty of them. But the message is brought to the liars because we are so, have been so afflicted and oft times continue. Oh Lord, bring us to present the message in a culture that hates truth. And secondly, we have perspective. What does God provide for his people who are living in corrupt places? Message and perspective to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul calls Gentile believers saints. This would have been tough for a first century Jew to hear this. Are you kidding? They are the goy. They stink. They're outside. What are you saying, Paul? He says they've been set aside by God, and he calls them saints or people set aside who are in Ephesus, which is a cesspool. So they're saints in a cesspool? How? It's not what they have done, but the work of God through Jesus Christ. Because it says, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. If we leave off the Christ Jesus, we don't have anything. They are saints in a cesspool. Besides expanding the notion of being a saint, you're set apart. One is also faithful, but in Christ Jesus. In Greek and Christ Jesus, and does it mean? Means in the sphere of, in and under the influence of Jesus Christ, under his authority, under his power. That's what it means. They're not faithful on their own, but in Christ Jesus, in union with him, they are saints. The saints in Ephesus are therefore secure in Christ, even in an unholy environment. And that is the perspective that he wanted the Ephesian church to have and the other churches in close proximity. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, because of Christ and their union with him by faith, they 
are set apart even in a cesspool. Doesn't mean they won't be persecuted, but their salvations are secure. They are in the midst of an unholy environment. What perspective should they have? Huh. We're set apart. We're faithful by Christ Jesus alone, even in a cesspool like Ephesus. Now, with respect to our situation, we are secure in Christ Jesus. In spite of the aggressive action taken by local versions, or that is American versions, of Marxism, the land is corrupt, there's no question. <laughs> no matter how aggressive, the opposition gets, we are still secure in the truth that we belong to Christ. This should be our perspective even now. Do we therefore see ourselves as saints or as victims? To see ourselves as saints places ourselves in a place of security in the midst of a cesspool where lying and corruption abound. We are secure in our salvations only because of Jesus, even in an unholy environment. I don't care what the opposition is. Are we afraid of the possibilities for ministry? Let me tell you, no self-centered or ridiculous politician can take our salvations away from us. First Thessalonians, note this. This is the very word of God. And this is where, <clears throat> this is where we, we take our hope. Listen to this. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. This is right after the, the great picture of the day of the Lord. For God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. So our perspective is one of saints. Yes, we sin. But we have the provision of grace to receive forgiveness and to carry on. Our perspective is one of being in union with Christ, even in the midst of an unholy environment. That's our perspective. That's what Paul wanted the Ephesian church to have. And that's what God wants us to have today. You know what? To the saints who are in Kwamba and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Let us consider that this week, our perspective, set apart, faithful in Christ Jesus in an unholy environment, trusting in him for the ability to be faithful. That's where we must go. So what does God provide for his people who live in corrupt, corrupt, corrupt places? He provides a message and he provides a perspective. The message that is authorized by Christ and we are sent into the world to bring it. It is a message that is infinitely trustworthy. And then the perspective, we go as saints, even though we may dwell in a corrupt place, in a corrupt nation, in a corrupt culture. We have the right perspective. Because of the call of God, we are set aside. Now listen to this. Verse 2, the third word is blessing. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a blessing and a prayer. This is something that has encouraged me over the years. Let us bless each other honestly, this way, regularly. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What is he saying? These are not the words, grace and peace that is, of human origin. There are things we cannot provide for ourselves. The saints have already experienced a measure of grace and peace, but they need it in an ongoing sense. He desires that they might, they might experience them in greater measure. 
Paul wants the people to realize that God will continue to pour out grace upon them so they can overcome the, the obstacles of life. He will pour out grace, this favor from heaven. Notice it comes from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't come uh, from Publishers Clearing House. It comes from heaven. Grace to you. This, this sense of the presence of ongoing graciousness from God to us. Graciousness shown. We not only have the forgiveness of sins, but we have a new life. Ephesians 2, 5 through 6, notice this. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive with Christ by grace. You have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. By grace we have a new life. And according to chapter 2, verse 10 of the book of Ephesians, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we have a new life by grace. And uh, we are ordained as believers to do good works in an ongoing way. So we can say that grace is the power to overcome evil in a wicked age. The grace of God ongoing in the life of a believer encourages us. We have been saved. We have a new life. In a real sense, not in the final sense, already not yet, we're seated in the heavenlies with Christ by grace and we're called and given the ability to do good works upon salvation so that the name of Christ might be exalted we also have peace and it goes with grace it is that great rest that comes to the Christian knowing that we have been saved and he is at work empowering us graciously empowering us to do what he's called us to do what many Christians in this country suffer from is a lack of peace. We are afraid. What kept Paul going when he suffered greatly was the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding. If we know grace, we will know peace. Many Christians lack peace, and I do too on many occasions, and I must return to the Word and look, what has Christ done for me? What is He doing for me right now? But know this, in the modern age, we can be assured that in the face of great trouble, the gospel will not be stopped by anything. We can have peace in knowing that we've been rescued from sin and death, we've been given a new life, in a very mysterious and wonderful way, we're seated in the heavenlies with Christ. Just read that. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. And peace, a shalom, comes with that. And we rest and trust in God increasingly, knowing that we cannot, in the final sense, be defeated. We cannot. Oh, they may take our lives. Oh, yes. But so what? Holding on to Christ, serving him through the word of God, is what we are to do by the power of the Spirit. Nothing can take away from us the blessings of grace and peace. And when we think about, oh, we can be fought against, and many Christians must return to what grace means in order to understand the peace that comes from heaven. We have been saved. We are seated in the heavenlies in a unique way. God gives us the power through his grace to live on. And in that we have rest. <sighs> Here are some questions. Are we growing in our appreciation for the truth that grace and peace are a part of our lives? Are we at peace in that God works through our weaknesses and not in our personal strength? Sure, we don't have any strength. Look around us. Look what's going on. <laughs> I don't need the telly. I'll just read an article here and there. I don't need all that discouragement. 
But I can say this. I don't care what, what, you know, what the left gets up to in the final sense. I want them to be saved. But they're not going to steal my peace. God has graciously bestowed upon me salvation, which I did not deserve, graciously given me the ability, even though I'm a wretch, to live that out moment by moment, increasingly, I hope, by Christ. He's done that for me. Where, therefore, is my rest? Let it come, O Lord. Are we certain that the kingdom will not be defeated? It will not be defeated. Take my life, yes. But you'll not take my grace. And you'll not take my peace. For they come from heaven. What does God provide for his people living in corrupt places? He provides message, perspective, and blessing. Blessing. What blessings? Grace and peace. What do you mean? Unusual favor, saved, even though we have no merit, and given the ability to live rightly for God. Peace? Yeah, that results from that. We don't have, we don't have the resources or the ability to fight all this wickedness. But God does. And I can rest in that. Christ does. So a couple of final things before we pray and close out our service and go to learn more. What has God shown today that must be removed from our lives, O Christians? That must be replaced with something else so we might stand better in this evil age? What are our obstacles to living well? Why are we so afraid? What are the things that cause us great fear? What, is, what are the things that are robbing our peace? What is making us nervous every day? What are they? Replace them by the Holy Spirit's power with confidence and contentment in Christ alone. In Christ alone, we take our stand in Christ alone. And perhaps the Holy Spirit has said to a person here, you have no Jesus. You have experienced You've not experienced the grace that comes from my hand, says the Lord. Therefore, repent and trust in Jesus Christ. Turning away from a life of self-centeredness, a life of fear, and a life of confusion, and trust in Jesus Christ, who will give graciously bestow upon us many things, lavish us with grace and peace. Trust in him. The Bible says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Isn't that a wonderful verse? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. O oh God, so move in hearts today. Pastor Joel, would you lead us in prayer, please, sir? Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21. Let's pray this together. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.